The day I landed in Brussels in January 2011, 50,000 people had been marching in the streets of Brussels demanding that a government be formed because uh, Belgium was about to beat Iraq in the number of days, uh, run consecutive days without uh, a proper government. And uh, so I was aware immediately of the country's I didn't know a bit about it before, but that was a very solid reminder of the special situation in which Belgium found itself. And also it was interesting that so many of my colleagues and friends in Belgium uh, were worried over the situation. And this, in a sense, colored my stay here, uh, at least in scholarly and but partly also in, in, in social terms, that the overall discussion has been about the future of Belgium and the role of the uh, public sphere in creating national identity and providing uh, an explanation also, the role of the public sphere and an explanation of why Belgium is in the situation it is. So, in a sense, what is my theoretical or scholarly uh, main interest in public sphere theory and in democratic theory relating to the concept of the public sphere found that to be very relevant and that the students and the colleagues that I've met have been interested in this. So it's been a very rewarding experience uh, scholarly wise and socially also because there are so many nice people in this country and in Bruxelles uh, or Brussel, I better say both versions uh, in general. Plus great food very nice parks near to the Place Jourdain where I lived, Louis Ap, not least. So I have definitely enjoyed and learned a lot from being here. So I'm very grateful for having had this experience. The interesting thing for me was that my being invited was the result of an initiative where the VUB uh, had joined with its neighbor across the street, the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and with the University of Ghent, to do this invitation. So this was a cross, it was a bilingual, <laughs> bilingual, bicultural, bi-ethnic kind of initiative, and I quite liked that. But in Brussels, most of the people I met would speak uh, French, but it was also uh, clearly uh, uh, a great presence of um, uh, Flemish speakers and uh, uh, both here and there I could uh, you know, get, get discussions, hear discussions of the situation and so on. So it, it was definitely present. But what people could unite about was the frit and the beer and maybe chocolate. I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure about the chocolate, but the beer and the frit, that's something that unites. And I mean, that's probably where uh, an attempt to reconstruct this marriage, to use the metaphor that I just used when speaking, reconstructing this marriage might start with the frit and the beer and find out what in everyday life, and not just in cultural history, but in cultural practices, will unite Belgians and separate them from their neighbors, neighboring countries. That's not for me for to, it's not for me to, to do, that's for Belgians to do. Well, concerning the Belgian situation, my conclusion is that you need one 
public sphere. You, can have, you cannot have a nation with two entirely separated public spheres. That will produce two nations. And of course you can have two nations and some kind of very thin layer of a couple of institutions on top, but I think that the, that will only, um, that will feel artificial in the wrong way. Uh, in the long run, you will either, either have to split or you will have to make really, uh, make really ambitious efforts to reconstruct a united public sphere. So it's up, actually it's up to Belgians to decide whether they want the divorce now, which might be also complicated because of you know, national debts and things that are to be shared. Tough parts of divorce is often sharing whatever you own or whatever you don't own but have in debt, right? So the same will apply here. But the other possibility is being really creative and ambitious and thinking, how can we save this nation state, Belgium? And that will take some media policy and some cultural policy and some educational policy and, and uh, other things also, I guess, to, in order to, uh, to get something done. One of the uh, thinkers about national identity that I talked about in my inaugural speech in March uh, of last year, Anna Renan, talks about national identity as something you choose, basically. And he also compares it to a marriage, because he says that just like a marriage is picked up again every day when you decide to stay in it and not just walk out the door, it's the same with national belonging, that it's a matter of deciding that I will be French today too, in the sense that I will all, I'm a Protestant, but I'm French. I will forget about, forget about the Huguenots, but I will remember this, uh, the uh, human rights or whatever, you know, so. And it's the same thing that have to be clear to Belgians as well, that you need to make an informed choice and then stick to it. But national identity will not come growing out of the ground. It will not overwhelm you from the flowers and the trees. It will come from a, from a choice. And then you can build emotions around that choice or you can have that choice made partly on emotional reasons or whatever. But it's, it's not something that comes out of nature. It's a, it's a, it's a choice.